this week in gaming. I've got to do the show! Hello again, folks. This is Andy Burkansky filling in. Shaggy Dave is not able to be here today. We'll still listen to a little bit of Pokemon. Let's hear that again. Oh, I love that theme. Really, really do. But it'll be uh, slowly fading out and out for the remainder of this. Unfortunately, we will not have the same flair and panache that you may be used to with these uh, newses of the week from Shaggy Dave. Unfortunately, my fingers are not as nimble on the board. I'm looking at about a thousand buttons in front of me, terrified. So... We'll get through this, but I just wanted to start off with um, some very recent news happened over the weekends. Phil Fish. Now, if you don't know who Phil Fish is, he is a very prominent indie developer. He created, uh, with his team rather, created the game Fez. Fez is an adorable, um, really, really well-made, kind of pixelated, interesting game. If you haven't had a chance to play it, pick it up because it is um, it's a lot of fun. It's one of the first games we, we looked at here on this show, and it's a really great experience. Um, basically, what has happened is he has gone insane. Now, you may not put me in that uh, in that camp, you may put yourself rather in that camp of believing that the Polytron game creator is insane, but let's just, uh, let's let you judge that. Basically, there was a feature on game trailers. They have a short show called Invisible Walls. In this show, there's a guy named Marcus Beer. He calls fish blowfish, you know, tall, just doesn't say very nice things about Phil Fish and uh, the way he creates games. Well, Phil Fish, you know, he went to Twitter, responded, and uh, let's just say he was not very happy. I'll, I'll give you the direct tweets. Um, Mr. Marcus Beer mentioned that the Fez creator is um, very, very successful. And Mr. Fish responded by saying, you're right, we are very successful. We're not going anywhere. Get used to it, you middle-aged parasites. And he finished it off with, compare your life to mine, excuse me, and then kill yourself. Again, this is him talking to a media representative who was a little critical of him. He said, compare your life to mine and then kill yourself. Apparently, he said later he was referencing a poor Futurama episode. Again, I was looking for that quote. I'm a pretty big Futurama fan. I did not recognize it. But uh, after that point, you know, he was um, responded to that because a lot of people were, again, coming to him and saying, why have you gone insane? And, uh, you know, his response was very human. He says, how would you react to this kind of stuff, instead of what he actually said. If you were me, considering it's going on for years now, would you take the high road? I'm being attacked constantly, and I can't fight back ever. So yeah, it doesn't seem very fair. So basically, he he feels victimized, and in that victimization, he exploded with anger. Now, that explosion translated to him announcing, and the Twitter um, for Polytron, which is the creators of the his company, that Fez 2, which a lot of people are excited about, is canceled. That's it. It's canceled. So very, very interesting um, predicaments there, uh, progressions at that point, that it has been canceled. Very, very odd. Because, again, he said directly, I'm done. Fez 2 is canceled. And then the uh, the game's Twitter page followed that. I hate this because it does found, I feel like we're following gossip. But I do think it is interesting to look at the game industry in this sort of way, because oftentimes we don't consider game developers as real people. You know, we see them in their highly elevated stages and we look at them in different sorts of ways. And this is a great example of perhaps an individual who was caught off on a bad day. You know, he didn't want criticism in that moment and it really, really affected him. Now for him to then say, compare your life to mine and then kill yourself. Let's just say if I was, ever did that, if I was ever talking to someone and I thought they were being uh, particularly vitriolic and I responded in such a manner, I, I guarantee because you know I'm working for someone else beyond myself, there would be ramifications. So it's interesting that he has that freedom being an indie developer owning his own company because I guarantee um, someone like uh, Casey Hudson, who had to deal with just the hatred. He's the Bioware game director, the man responsible for um, Mass Effect 3, one of the many people responsible for Mass Effect 3. And he had hate, death threats beyond reproach slung against him when Mass Effect 3 did go live and people found out um, about the endings. You see, that's a man who didn't respond in this way. He didn't get upset. He didn't threaten to ask the person to kill themselves. He may not have acted appropriately, but I think it just shows that when you're tied 
to a huge economic powerhouse, you can't talk like this. Maybe developers really feel like this, you know, maybe this is just kind of through the looking glass of what these real people feel when uh, the community that is us who are commentating on what they do, when we get a little too nasty, when we get a little too vitriolic. Now, again, I, I don't think you should have canceled it because of it. Like, if you do want to pout and be upset, that's fine. But why not let that conversation keep going? Why not continue, you know, that vitriol on both sides would have been entertaining. And in the end, you just would have gotten pressed for your product. So again, it seems like he's very, very hurt. We'll have to keep an eye on this. It's a shame if Fest2 does get canceled because of that. But again, it's just really interesting to um, see what one developer who is not tied in through economic blinders can do if he really wants to. All right, now the uh, the second thing we absolutely have to discuss, big news for Activision. Activision is one of the largest video game companies on the planet worth billions and billions. A lot of that money was from the parent company Vivendi. Well, over the week, uh, many subsidiaries and different institutions in Activision announced they are buying back 429 million shares. It's going to be um, uh, worth about $5.8 billion on one hand. That's from Pure Activision, then Activision Blizzard is funding the acquisition of about $1.2 billion worth of that. So we're looking at about $9 billion they're giving to Vivendi so they can get their company back so it's just theirs. Now, Vivendi still is holding about a uh, 12% stake. I hope I'm saying that correctly as well. But um, they will no longer have the economic reins. Now, looking into this as gamers, you got to think, how does this affect you? And in a lot of ways, at least initially, it doesn't, and it shouldn't. But the, I think the interesting thing is Vivendi is not doing very well. They were owed a lot of money from a lot of different people. And this kind of frees up Activision uh, financially and economically to be a little more independent, to be a little more true to what they want to do. I don't think this will bleed down to um, actual gameplay and actual game development. I think this is purely about publishing options, the ability for this massive corporation to have control and to really allow themselves to have these economic you know, windfalls, because that's the other big thing. The numbers for the next quarter of their revenues are coming in. They're supposed to be huge. They're supposed to be, I believe, uh, $1.5 billion for the quarter. So, again, they are making this money. Why give it to someone who's a sinking ship? They've earned it. Let them have it. Um, it is interesting, though, that this information, this big acquisition, comes on the heels of one of their top franchises, one of the most popular video games of all time, going down, really not doing as well, World of Warcraft at the end of the last quarter, had 7.7 million subscribers. Now, in May, it was 8.3 million. So in that short period of time, they lost one, excuse me, they lost 600,000 players. Now, well, Activision is saying a lot of that has to do with um, Chinese markets just decreasing, turning into more casual engagement. But I really think it's interesting because they haven't given, you know, a real answer for this. Their next quarter numbers are coming up. They're supposed to be doing well. But 600,000 people are now no longer playing. I spent a lot of time with the game, and I stopped about a year ago and got big into um, Star Wars The Old Republic for some reason. Love that game. And it's interesting because maybe it is just the fact that it is an older franchise. They're trying to innovate. They had the Mist of Pandera, where you could play as a panda bear. That's what we all wanted. I, I want to know what they can do so they can still be competitive. At its core, they've done such amazing things, things that some games have never even close to begin to do in terms of setting paradigms for the industry. They've never, other developing uh, development companies rather, didn't even get close to this. And it's a shame, again, they have millions of people playing, so they can't be that upset. But I want to know what they can do to get those players back. Me, what they can really do, see, I, I haven't really thought about it. It's just, it's the fact that it's an old franchise. It really is at this point. It's a franchise that we know, that we enjoy, we like the mythos, but for someone like me who has put in, oh my god, embarrassingly, when you go to the game play, or time played, I think, slash played, yes, that handy little, uh, <laughs> uh, little um, thing you can type in there when you are playing WoW, and it'll tell you how long you played. I, it was about 100 days, so a third of a year. I played in this in a world that isn't real. So that shows you that there is dedication here, that there was a real love for this game and a lot of time put in. And it's just, it's all gone. It doesn't matter to me anymore. And I think a lot of that is just because it ran its course. And until they really find a way to reinvent the franchise, maybe a top to bottom reinvention, I don't think they're going to do that. But we really got to see whether or not they want to get 
you know, these players back or just be happy with about a six to five million subscription base. If they can still be economically viable and they haven't overextended where they expect a certain amount of money each quarter, then that's great. And they can keep making great products for a, a fairly large, you know, consumer base. These are not minimal numbers, you know. This is not the uh, the basic Kickstarter stuff. It's funny when we talked to Brian Fargo a little bit, the uh, CEO there of uh, NX Isle and did a bunch of the uh, the old great games like Wasteland. He has his Kickstarter campaign for Wasteland 2. Huge press, and they had about, I think it was either 72 or 150,000. I can't, I think both numbers it was 150,000. They had that many subscribers. And he said if that was any other company, they would kill themselves because, or the, the execs would, because that wouldn't even begin to break the bank of the money they need. So back to WoW, they have that huge core fan base that's still there. I think they're just, it's the natural loss of a game that is that old, that has uh, provided that much opportunity for so long. You know, it's just run its course. That's the way it is. And uh, one of the other topics that I really want to discuss is uh, Ubisoft, the head honcho there, CEO. God, I'm going to butcher this name. Yes, Gilmonto. No, that's wrong. Gilmont. Yes, Gilmont. He was uh, talking about his company today, and he had an interesting new concept for where Ubisoft is going with next gen. I'll read exactly what the quote was. Uh, this is Mr. CEO Yves Guillemot. We need to release open world games on a regular basis. Open world has proved to be the clear direction where game genres have evolved. It began with GTA for the action segments. Then it happened to adventure with Assassin's Creed. I don't know about that. To RPG with Skyrim. And last year it was the first major entry into FPS with Far Cry 3. The crew showed at E3, which can also be a big differentiator, well, it's a difficult world, for the driving segment and excitement around the division, confirms how relevant it is to RPG games. So he's basically saying these new games that they will be making are going to be big open world games. I think he has touched on something that is accurate in the industry. We look at the games that we really love, the ones that you put in your 150, you know, maybe even 200 hours in. They're usually those sorts of games that are open-ended, that are massive open worlds. And he does cite some great references there. And I think a lot of this just has to do with, um, when talking developers, they say that the current paradigms in the industry are basically this is how it works, usually. When you have a development team, they're making the core components, the core tools of their games. Bethesda does it really well with their open worlds. You know, Bioware has what they need for their segments. And Ubisoft, they've made it with the Assassin's Creed, and they're bringing that to Watch Dogs. They have the tools, and now they get to bring in the, I don't want to say ancillary, but not nearly as fundamental of the work that you do need. Um, you don't need to spend two years making an entirely new basis when you already have, granted, a very, very strong way to play the game. So I think that's a big reason why, because economically... It makes a lot more sense. In terms of looking out for players, though, um, last week we had our interview with the team behind The Witcher 3. Really, really enjoyed it. Can't wait for that game. And the um, surprisingly, one of the major comments and messages that we got from that interview when we announced, when we talked about it being open world, is gamers just lamenting the fact that it was going that route. And the simple reason, they don't have the time. And it's really interesting. You think about it, and as uh, some of the major consumers of gamers are getting older and older and unfortunate responsibilities of life are dripping into you know the day-to-day -day activities, we can't have several open-world games anymore that we're trying to get off our list. It just it can't happen. We can't have Batman Origins, Saints Row 4, GTA, and, GTA 5, and Watch Dogs. If those are your list of games to play, First of all, you're not even going to probably finish any of them, and you won't really even play them as much as you perhaps would. You won't really enjoy them in the same way. And it's interesting that he says, you know, this is the way um, game developers are going. I think it's unfortunate because we look at a game like The Last of Us, which isn't open world at all. It's direct, beautiful, amazing narrative chocolate that, you know, fulfills certain artistic nuances that no other game's done before. Can't speak of it highly enough, but it was a very direct maybe 10, 12 hour campaign that provided more enjoyment and that sort of narrative resonance that a game that I love, probably one of my favorite games of all time, uh, Fallout New Vegas, I uh, arrived at that after about 25, 
to the 50 to 100 hour mark. I got to that. And, you know, there were similar experiences, but very different roads to get there. And I think we'll see with the success of The Last of Us that the CEO might be um, out of sorts here when he's saying that solely because gamers don't have enough time. If you want us to play The Crew, The Division, and Watch Dogs, and Far Cry 4, it's not going to happen. We may buy one of those games, and maybe that's what you're counting on, but it's interesting, and I don't think as someone who loves open-world games that completes every little thing that buys the guide afterwards and spent and, tr- and look, makes it look like a, an accredited textbook because I put all the you know connotations and indentations that you need there so everyone knows uh, that I can look back and then find it. You know, someone like that saying that maybe we should go in this other direction, I think is surprising. And this uh, tops into the idea that Ubisoft also said they won't be publishing any games that they don't think they cannot make into a franchise. It's, again, I got to say, who do you think you're talking to when you make statements like that? Usually, if someone's listening to you speak as the CEO of a, a company like Ubisoft, they're going to have some familiarity and love for the gaming industry. If they're on a site, if they're listening to the show right now, they know something about gaming. And when you say something like that, you have to understand that you're alienating yourself to ma- at least what everyone hopes to represent. They hope to represent the underdog. They hope to believe that you know everyone wants to be their hipster in their own way. And when you say you only make blockbusters, that you only want to make games that will have that uh, broad appeal, there's such, I think, a corporate idiocy there. It could well be um, your you know continued economic plan, you know development plan, absolutely. But think about your audience of who you're talking to when you're making statements like that. I think far too often uh, gaming PR reps aren't considering the audience they're talking to. It's an audience that's already aware of a lot of the PR speak you're going to be dripping out. It's very, very likely they're aware, they're entrenched, they're passionate, and more often than not, they don't want to believe, maybe there's a better way to say it, everyone kind of wants to still believe that playing video games is special to them. They still want to believe that either they're alienated by it um, in terms of you know mass culture that's still considered perhaps a <laughs> something of low cunning to play video games. They they want to have that still that belief, and moreover than not, it wants to seem special. You know the biggest thing when we talk to uh, Chris Avalon, the uh, mastermind, one of the masterminds, just I always got to preface that behind Fallen New Vegas when I talked about how much I was just so excited that I got that scene with Boone when he killed Caesar, and it's just so powerful for me how I got that scene. It felt special to me. He says they know that, and that's what they consider. They want to make sure that you have your individual special moments that are more difficult to get because they feel special to you because that is really you know, what gaming is about, that you have those instances that feel personal to you, that feel special to make an experience that speaks directly to you. And when Ubisoft says something like the only thing they're going to make are, you know, these sorts of games, they're only going to make games that are blockbusters. I don't think it's forward thinking, even if they rightly do only make games that are blockbusters. It's not the way to go. And uh, before we end off, I just want to mention one little thing. I again, something that just kind of happened very recently. Very excited about it. I hope you are, too. It's about Star Wars Episode seven. Oh, listen to that. Listen to that beauty. That is right. Mr. John Williams himself will be composing the score for the next few Star Wars movies. Listen again. Oh, it is too beautiful. I'm just, I'm very excited about that. Obviously, it's isn't video game related, but uh, John Williams is back and it's very, very happy. This negates the pain, perhaps, that I have. Uh, a little more time. Oh, there we go. Uh, the pain I felt, perhaps, that they mentioned that Ryan Gosling and Zac Efron may take the rules of uh, Anakin Solo and other characters in Episode 7. Even though, rightfully so, uh, Ryan Gosling, not so much, but Zac Efron does look a lot like um, Anakin Solo in the comics, he re- or the um, the extended universe. He does look a lot like him, folks. It's upsetting, but it, it is true. So again, that is your News of the Week, a little more in-depth, a little more analysis there. If you have anything you'd like to comment on what we just said here um, about Phil Fish, about Activision, or about my perhaps barbed comments at Ubisoft, please send us a note. It's uh, VGS underscore 640 on Twitter, Video Game Sophistry on Facebook, and email us. That is 640toronto.com. I was going to be VGS at 640toronto.com. Now, of course, our feature interview of the day 
cannot wait for it. Batman Arkham Origins looks incredible. And we got to really go in depth of what this game is going to provide. And then we even got little tidbits of other games that are coming out. This is all with Kyle Moffat. He's the uh, one of the big wigs there at WB. Recorded a few weeks ago. I hope you enjoy Andy Burkowski, BGS.